Yo, what up? Josh here from Budget Church live streaming. A lot of times when people's live streams look bad, they jump straight into buying new, more expensive cameras and gear. But what if I told you you don't need more expensive cameras and gear if you don't know how to use the settings on the ones you have already? In this video, I'm going to explain the most common settings in your camera, how they work together, and how you can set them up to make your live streams look amazing. I may even give you one bonus setting to look at if you're lucky. Wait till the end to find out. Let's get into it. So, you want your live streams to look good, but you're not entirely sure on how to set up your cameras to do that? Well, first things first, set your camera to manual. And when I say manual, I mean manual settings, manual focus, manual everything that you can. It can be tempting to put our cameras into some sort of auto mode. After all, it's auto. It probably knows more than we do. There are a handful of problems to using any kind of auto exposure settings, though. First off, we want to make sure that all of our cameras look consistent across the board. This doesn't mean that they all have the same exposure settings, it just means that as you jump from one to the other, it should look how you expect it to look. This is extremely hard to control if the exposure settings of your camera are changing without you touching them. Speaking of things changing, the lights in our sanctuaries change a lot during our services. If our cameras are set to auto color and auto white balance, etc., they're going to change to try to keep up with those lights changing. We don't really want that to happen because we want to actually see those change in lights, not have our camera adjust so that they're invisible to us. Finally, the visual style of our live streams helps set the mood and tell a story about what's happening in our church. Just like you wouldn't set a playlist to shuffle as your worship from the stage, we also don't want our cameras making decisions for us. We want to make those decisions in order to set the mood and communicate what's truly happening in our church. Hopefully that convinces you that manual is the only way to go. And like I said, that's manual settings and manual focus, which means yes, you're going to have to have your volunteers practice pulling manual focus. Now that that's settled, let's take a look at what settings you'll actually need to change on your camera. The four big settings we're gonna look at today are white balance, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. First off, let's take a look at white balance. All light has a temperature, meaning that it can be either warm or it can be cool. That temperature is measured in Kelvin, which is a unit of degrees. That doesn't really matter. That's science class. That's not this class, but just know it. In Kelvin, higher numbers are cooler and lower numbers represent warmer temperatures. But why does that matter? Because the way that we see colors is directly impacted by the temperature of the light around it. Take this piece of paper, for example. You and I both know that it is a white sheet of paper. Well, I guess you don't know that, but I do. If we were to look at it under warm colored light, it's gonna look really yellow and orangish and just gross. Conversely, if we were under, you know, some super cool fluorescent bulbs, it's gonna look pretty blue and not really white. That's white balance. You know the paper's white, I know the paper's white, but it doesn't look white. We need to adjust our camera settings so that colors appear the way that they really should. Luckily, the white balance setting is a way to tell your camera what the temperature of the light is around you. That way it can compensate for what it knows colors should actually look like. Like we just saw with the paper, if your white balance isn't set to the correct value, everything is going to look off, resulting in a really gross looking and kind of distracting image. The last thing we want for our live streams. There are a few ways to go about setting the white balance in your camera. Again, they usually have an auto white balance function, but we're not gonna use it. Instead, we want to set a manual Kelvin value within our cameras. But how do we know what value to set it to? I'm glad you asked. Some of you might actually know the color temperature of the lights in your auditorium. Common light temperatures are 3200 and 5600, which are known as warm white and cool white, respectively. If you know the color temperature of your lights, you can set the white balance in your camera to match, and you should be good to go. If you don't, there's still something you can do. You can use a white piece of paper like I just showed to dial it in manually, or some cameras even have an auto set function where you can look at the camera and say, that's white, and your camera will set the temperature accordingly. While you definitely want your white balance to be set pretty close to accurate, it definitely doesn't have to be perfect. You might even set it slightly off normal just as a style choice to help communicate a different mood for your church. Just figure out what works best for you and set it up. Just remember, you may have to set all of your cameras differently depending on where they are in the room, the make and model of the camera, and any other factors. So just check them all independently. Next, we're going to look at aperture. First off, you may have heard of aperture as the f-stop of your camera. People use those terms interchangeably, and I will too for the rest of this video. The aperture refers to how big of an opening there is between your lens and the sensor behind it. As you open the aperture, more light will hit the sensor, and when you close the aperture, less light will hit the sensor, creating darker or brighter images. The f-stop is the actual value that you have the aperture set to. 
The most important thing to know here is that the smaller the f-stop value, the larger the aperture. I know that's kind of confusing, but you'll get the hang of it in no time. The other big thing that aperture controls is the depth of field of your image. We've all seen those great videos where everything behind the subject is super blurry and out of focus, but the subject themselves is super sharp and completely in focus. That's called a shallow depth of field. It can be used to prevent things in your background from distracting from the subject or the foreground. To get a shallow depth of field like this, you're going to open the aperture as wide as it goes, so the lowest f-stop value you have. If you close your aperture or make the f-stop bigger, you'll get a large depth of field, which means that everything in your image is going to be in focus, whether it's up close or far away. So those are the two things that aperture controls, the brightness and the depth of field. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Right now, my camera is set to a pretty wide aperture, but let's see what happens when I close it down or increase the f-stop value. As you can see, my image is getting darker, and what you may not be able to see is that the background is actually coming more and more in focus. Now, as I open the aperture back up, pay attention to that background and see what happens. As I scroll this wheel, you can tell that the background actually comes out of focus, leaving just me, the subject, in focus. And obviously, it got a lot brighter. A lot of people like to shoot wide open or with the largest aperture they can. This creates the really nice depth of field that I was talking about before, creating what's known as bokeh or the blurred background. The danger you run into with a low f-stop like that is that you have such a narrow plane of focus. What I mean is so little of your image is in focus that it's easy to lose it. As I lean towards the camera, you can see that I'm actually going out of focus. And as I lean back, I get back into it and the other way around as I go back farther. This can be difficult on volunteers if they're not good at racking the focus on their camera live with the rest of what's happening on stage. In those cases, it's better to use a higher f-stop. You may not get quite as nice of an image, but it'll be in focus, which always looks better. Everything about the aperture is a trade-off, so figure out what works best for you. Next up, shutter speed. The shutter speed of your camera is exactly what it sounds like. It's the speed that the shutter is opening and closing on your camera. Not all cameras these days have a physical shutter that's actually opening and closing, but it's the same idea. A low shutter speed means that the shutter is opening and closing just a few times per second, whereas a high shutter speed means that it's opening really, really fast. The shutter speed has a few different effects on how your video looks. A low shutter speed is going to result in an image that's much brighter, whereas a high shutter speed will get darker, that's because the shutter is opening and closing more times in a second, which means on average it's spending more time closed, which means less light on the sensor. The other effect that you see with shutter speed is motion blur. The lower your shutter speed, the more motion blur. This is because more motion will happen in the downtime between frames, creating more of a blurring effect across the screen, versus a high shutter speed will capture every step of your motion, making it look extremely smooth. This is a little bit easier to explain if you see it, so let's take a look. Right now, my shutter speed is set to 60. Watch what happens if I lower it down. Now, this is an extreme example. I set it down to 4. You can see there's a lot of blurring going on, and it's extremely bright. Here at 20, you can still see there's some motion blurring, and it's still brighter than it was before, but it's not nearly as intense as it was down at the low level. Now what happens when I bring it up? I've just set it to 200. You may not be able to tell that the motion is any smoother, but I definitely can on my monitor here. You should be able to tell, however, that I got a lot darker. Now that you've seen the effects of shutter speed, it's time to let you in on a little secret. Generally with video, you want to set the value of your shutter speed to one over double your frame rate. So let's do some math. Let's imagine you're shooting at 60 frames per second. You shouldn't be, but let's just imagine you are. That means that you want your shutter speed to be set at one over 120. Then if you were at 30 frames per second, you would want 1 over 60, and at 24, the superior frame rate, you would set it to 1 over 48. Most consumer cameras don't really have a 1 over 48 section, so you can set it to 1 over 50 as something that's very close. This definitely isn't a hard and fast rule, it's just what generally looks best at those different frame rates, but you can definitely play with it as you see fit. One reason you might need to adjust around that rule is LED lights. Lights are actually fluctuating really, really fast in order to produce different hues and colors. And if your shutter speed is set wrong, you can actually see that flickering happening in the background. It also might manifest itself with black lines scanning across the screen as you're watching. These are obviously both not ideal, so you may have to adjust your shutter speed in order to avoid these. Future Josh here. If you look over to the left side of the screen, you can actually see this happening in my background because of the lights. Okay, back to the video. With all that in mind, pick what shutter speed works best 
but stick close to that two times rule. Finally, let's take a look at ISO. ISO is essentially your camera's sensitivity to light. Different cameras will have different ranges that you can actually set this value to, but it works the same across all cameras. The higher the ISO number, the brighter your image will be, and the lower the number, the darker it will be. However, as you increase that ISO, you'll also introduce noise in your image. That can look like grain or other artifacts. This is why you wanna make sure you have adequate lighting in your image. Let's take a look at a real life example. Right now I have quite a bit of light shining at me from over here, so I actually have my ISO pretty low, down at about 200. But let's see what happens if I increase it. Now this is an extreme example. I've set it to 6400 and I'm very well lit right now, which means everything about me is blown out completely. But what happens if I turn out the lights? Now you can see I'm pretty well lit with the ISO up at 6400, but you can probably notice some artifacts and grain in the image. It's not as clean as it was before. Because of this, you wanna make sure that you have adequate lighting so that you don't have to crank that ISO super high. The darker your environment, the more you'll notice that grain and fuzz in your image. Okay, that's better. As you can see, these settings all work together to set the exposure of your camera, as well as adjusting a few other things. However, because your aperture and shutter speed are usually set more as a stylistic choice and less because of your overall exposure levels, you generally only have ISO to adjust to actually bring the brightness up and down. But as we just saw, bringing that ISO up too high introduces noise into the image. So what are we supposed to do? Well, you're cranking it up because it's too dark, right? So. Turn on the lights. But seriously, a lot of people don't realize how important adequate lighting is to the quality of a live stream. Now I get it, lights are expensive and you don't always have control over the quality of lights in your building. Just keep it in mind that the quality of your lighting will directly impact the quality of your video. If your room is too bright and you can't actually bring your settings down low enough to accommodate it, then you can even start looking into a neutral density or ND filters. These are filters that you can put over the front of your camera and they kind of act as sunglasses. This way you can make things darker even beyond what the settings of your camera might allow. Okay, so you guys paid attention really well, so I am gonna give you that bonus setting that I talked about before. That's ridiculous, of course I was gonna show it to you. I already recorded this, I have no idea if you paid attention. But anyway, the secret is that most cameras actually allow you to program in a style or a look or even upload a separate LUT to control things like the hue, saturation, contrast, sharpness, and other color settings. If you haven't dug into your camera settings, you really should to see what it comes with. There might be a preset that looks great, or you might be able to dial things in manually and get something that looks awesome for your church. These are the types of things that most people would do in post-production, but this is a live stream, so we can't do anything in post. This is why you need to make sure that these are set correctly in your camera. You'll probably make very small changes, such as bumping the saturation, maybe increasing the contrast a little bit, but the results will be huge. If there's a specific color and feel that you wanna give your live stream, this is probably the best way to go about it. So it's definitely worth figuring out how to do in your camera. I hope you feel a lot more confident about the settings in your camera now. I know there's a lot to it, but once you learn how all these settings work together, you'll be able to take any environment and make it look good on the camera, and it will work wonders for your live stream. Leave a comment below about which setting you learned the most about, or which one you're still a little confused on and could use a few more pointers. Then make sure to like and subscribe so that way you can see when I upload a video, maybe answering your question. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.